Hello, everybody. We're getting ready to get started here. It's been a lot of work. I had to clean this place out. It was a mess. There were papers everywhere. This guy's never going paperless. He's also never going to be intelligent or a good presenter. So I wanted to warn everybody that this presentation is rated R for not very good. But at noon, we will have Don and Noseworthy. Don's not so good, but Noseworthy is very, very intelligent. And speaking of intelligence, there will be little of that displayed in today's presentation. In fact, even a dummy like me can understand all of this very easily. While for some of you, your heads just seem to spin. Now, I'm going to make a workers' comp claim eventually, because my neck does hurt. And I'm, I'm going to stick my neck out right here and say that if you stay and watch this webinar on spousal limited access trusts, followed by the presentation on estate planning for dummies, and we mean real dummies, <laughs> then you have my severe sympathy. Thank you very much. And you can wire money to my account so that I can eventually escape this life of not being appreciated. Thank you. You're gonna turn off the camera now. The show's about to start, Brittany. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, and a Corvette in Miami, and it's a nice Corvette in Miami. We welcome you to this presentation entitling SLAT Update and Strategies, including Florida's new law. I read that off the screen, pretty good, huh? So today's presenter, Alan S. Gassman, will be introduced by me, just a dummy. If you have any questions whatsoever during the presentation, you can email agassman at gassmanpa.com and see whether you are ignored. Here is Alan. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We are here today to talk about spousal limited access trusts. And as I've said before, we are not going to talk about the limitations of your spouse. That's something that your spouse always talks about, the limitations of you. And at noon, we are going to have a ventriloquist, a very wonderful ventriloquist, and his not so wonderful dummy, Noseworthy. So I hope you stick it out. If you have logged on through CPA Academy, you are going to get one free CPE hour, and I hope it will be worth it. If you have logged, on through our law firm website, then you're only going to get a headache because we do not qualify through the law firm for CPE credit because they've seen the webinars and they don't like them. So also there are going to be, I believe, handout se session in including your PowerPoints. If you have questions, go to the inverted King Tut pyramid, sing the song King Tut, by Steve Martin, and then type in your question. And Brittany will say, thank you for your question. And I will answer your question if I know the answer. You are here in the universe at SLAT Update. Next Saturday, Brandon Ketrin, who is much smarter and also taller than me, will be speaking about income tax aspects of estate tax planning. That's gonna be interested, interesting. And then Hamden Baskin, the next Saturday, is a very experienced and very interesting 
trust and probate litigator, and everybody needs to know about trust and probate litigation, whether you want to have some or not. So something else coming up that I wanted to make sure I mention, for the Ketterling Health System, Kettering Health System, on Tuesday, August 23rd, Jonathan Blotmacher, known to many as the greatest estate planner in the United States, and certainly the most well-respected estate planning lawyer in the United States, is going to join us and talk about cryptocurrency in estate planning. And even if you don't care anything about cryptocurrency, if you've ever seen Jonathan Blockmacher talk, you want to listen because he always teaches you something new. It's always interesting. Okay, Same, shameless self-promotion of our pension book. Sorry about that. A new article we just wrote on the Tax Advisor's Guide to the Inflation Reduction Act, and we'll be uh, presenting on that. Uh, when is that? Brittany, that's coming up uh, soon. Okay, that's coming up Wednesday, free at 4 p.m. I'm gonna be presenting with Peter Farrell, who's a law, very smart law student from Stetson Law School. The University of Notre Dame Estate Planning Conference just got finalized. You can go to their website and sign up. Wonderful programs, you get them all videoed, all virtual, and it's virtually good. A recent article on landmines and safe havens for slat planning, part one. You can read by clicking here. And Marty Shinkman and I are working today on part two. And I'm not sure what it's going to say because Marty hadn't given me the first draft yet. Okay, getting to the basics of spousal limited access trusts. And I am sorry if you hear sawing going on. It's probably in your backyard. It's probably not in my parking lot. My neighbor is sawing down his garage area. So if you like sawing, I happen to have a saw with me so that when somebody comes in and says, have you seen this? I can pull this out of my desk drawer and say, yes, I saw it. And that's pretty silly, isn't it? But I actually do that. And that's why I have that saw. All right, so when a person dies, their family becomes happy or unhappy, depending upon the situation, and a certain amount can pass a state tax free. And then you hope you have a spouse you love, because in order to avoid the federal estate tax, everything above the amount that passes a state tax free has to go to that spouse or to a Q tip trust where the spouse will get to clean his or her ears out as often as they want and has to get all income and may also receive amounts as needed for health education and maintenance and nothing can go to anyone else but that spouse. So let's say I'm worth $30 million and I die, I'm kind of sad, other people aren't as sad. So the first 12 million passes free of estate tax, the next 18 million. If I want to benefit my children with that 18 million, I can't. I have to leave it to my spouse outright or to a trust that pays her all income for her life and no one else can use it. So I'm in a, between a rock and a hard place because now I've got 18 million in a trust for her. That's well over her $12 million allowance and therefore there can be an estate tax problem. In addition, she might remarry. And if she remarries, which would be somebody much smarter than me, then how do I protect those assets from the next spouse when my spouse gets all the income, whether she wants it or not? So that is part of the estate tax quandary. The ETQ, that's whenever you see ETQ, that stands for estate tax quandary. Has nothing to do with Esquire magazine, because that's ESQ, which is estate something else quandary. But anyway, so here's me, and there's the 12,060,000, goes into the family trust, everything above it goes to the Q-tip trust, and everyone's very sad when my surviving spouse dies, because that's when the estate tax is due. 
and the life insurance gets put in an irrevocable life insurance trust, which is called an ILIT. It has nothing to do with matches. Okay. Then, of course, you have to decide who owns what. Well, in my marriage, everything is owned by spouse two, also known as Marsha. And what if I make a $12 million gift today, as soon as I'm done with this show, and I transfer $12 million worth of Q-tips, which I could buy at a Walgreens warehouse, into the Spousal Limited Access Trust. Now, Marsha can be the trustee of the trust. She can receive whatever she needs for health, education, maintenance, and support. She can direct where it goes when she dies. She might even be able to direct it for my benefit if she were to die first. And now the $12 million exemption that I had is in this trust. And if this trust doubles in value every 10 years, which is what a 7.2% rate of return will get you, which is the average rate of return for a 3565 well allocated portfolio, in 10 years, this is worth 24 million. In 20 years, it's worth 48 million. Now, at that time, I'll probably want it back because it's so much. But the point is that everything in this trust will pass free of estate tax, even though. I am able to pay the income tax attributable to the income of this trust. And the reason it's called a spousal limited access trust is because Marsha can control it completely as long as technically she can't receive more than she needs for health education, maintenance, and support, which we call the HIMS standard, or an independent trustee gives her whatever the independent trustee thinks is correct. So if you're insecure about the SLAT, you put in a provision that says, my spouse can choose anyone on the planet Earth, not related to her and not an employee of hers, and that person she picks to be the independent trustee has the power to give her whatever the independent trustee thinks is appropriate. So she goes and meets a friend, appoints the friend as independent trustee, independent trustee instructs her to give all the money back to herself, subject to a fiduciary duty, and therefore the SLAT is very, very flexible. It does not necessitate the filing of an income tax return as long as it's drafted to be what is called a defective grant or trust, and there is nothing defective about it other than the name, the defective grantor trust, which is also a crummy trust if you allow children to make withdrawals of up to 16000 a year to use your gift tax exclusion because of the tax court case of crummy versus the commissioner. I wish his last name had been really good, so we wouldn't we could call these really good trusts instead of crummy trusts. So then if you're still a control freak, it's not enough that you can replace your spouse as trustee of the trust. You could have the SLAT invest in a LLC and you can be the manager of the LLC, the sole signer on the account of the LLC, and you can make the ownership of the LLC by the SLAT non-transferable. So then when you ask your spouse, you know, I would like to have your consent to distribute $150,000 so that I can go ahead and buy that raccoon farm in Wyoming that I've always wanted. And the spouse says no. So you replace the spouse with a new trustee. If you're going to have the power to replace the spouse, it has to be with somebody who is not related to you or subordinate to you. Now, there's no one subordinate to me, but an employee technically is supposed to be. And family members, of course, don't do what you're going to tell them to anyway. But that is the slat. So let me now go to a polling question because the CPAs need to prove that they're here. So if you're with a CPA, please wake that CPA up. 
or if you're the CPA's cat, start listening. If you have, if you're a trained cat that can answer these polling questions, because I, I know that there are dogs that have been trained to, to when they see the word poll P, they know to hit the button while their owner is doing other things. Now I would never encourage that, but I just heard about them. Yeah. All right. So this polling question is going to give you a free PDF book. You can either select eight steps to a proper Florida trust and estate plan, grow your medical practice, creditor protection for Florida physicians, what estate planners need to know about bankruptcy, or the section 199A and 1202 handbook. So the polling question is this, which of these books would you like to receive? You only get one, eight steps, grow your medical practice, Creditor Protection for Florida Physicians, What Estate Planners Need to Know About Bankruptcy, or the 199A Handbook. Please hurry up so I can finish singing. Brittany, are we done? Nope. Okay, the polling question is still going on. Okay, thank you for completing the polling question within an hour. All right, here is a typical use of a slack. The client is the grantor. The client puts $3 million worth of Q-tips into a LLC. The client initially owns the 1% voting share and the 99% non-voting share. The client establishes an irrevocable trust for lovely spouse and descendants. And the client then, at least 20 or 30 days after the LLC is funded, transfers the 99% ownership interest to the SLAT and reports it on a gift tax return the following year due at the same time as the income tax return, which simply says, I have used, let's say, $2 million or $2,200,000 of my $12,060,000 exemption. Now, why isn't it 99% of $3 million? It's because of discounts. Government has like a blue light special situation because of the case law. When I give somebody 99% non-voting in an LLC, the gift is only worth what they got. It's not worth what I got out of my estate. So, in fact, Stacey Eastland likes to talk about, well, you have a beautiful $10 million Rembrandt and six children. Tear it up into six pieces. Give them each one sixth. When they put it back together, it's not worth $10 million. So, but if you have a Rembrandt, Please don't do what I just said and make sure that if you have other kind of paintings, maybe depending on what they are, but certainly not if it is a Rembrandt. Now, you know who Rembrandt is. He invented the toothpaste, that special toothpaste, but he was also a painter in Amsterdam, not at the same time as uh, Van Gogh or Van Dyck, but nevertheless a painter. Now, this family came to us and said, we want to put $3 million in the slat. Our financial advisor advised us to do that. And I said, but wait a minute, you have $9 million. And do you ever spend all your income? No, we don't. Okay, then let's put $9 million in an LLC, because then I can charge more for the LLC. And then let's set up the slat and give it a $6 million seed capital gift. Now, what does that mean? Well, this was a farming fa family, so they're able to take that seed capital gift and they're able to plant medical marijuana. No, they were not able to plant medical marijuana. This was not really a farming factor family. This was a stock and bond type of family, so they bought $6 million worth of stocks and bonds, no Q-tips, and then they put $9 million in the LLC. And what did they do? They sold the $9 million non-voting member interest in the LLC for a $6 million note, nine years interest only, 
with payments at 1.73%. So what happened? Well, after five or six years, it was worth 13 million five. So you would liquid, you could liquidate the LLC, wouldn't need to, probably best not to. But if you did, about three million four ends up in the trust, which repays the client the six million, and the trust has seven million five hundred thousand dollars that passes estate tax free, and is held for the surviving spouse. So that is a good one. I have more. Uh, let me go here and talk about the interest rate. And this is, we did this last week, but I think most of you were asleep if you were even here. So what we're going to do here on page 38 is look at how quickly the interest rates are coming up on these notes. If you have a low a high interest note, refinance now to the lower interest rate. And what I want you to keep in mind here is that we're in August of 2022 and if you didn't know that, you should probably not be signing a will or trust document anytime soon without careful supervision. But right now, the August 2022 rate for a note over 9% is 3.35%. But if you're making an installment sale, or in my opinion, if you're exchanging one note for another, you could use the June rate because you could use the lower of the rate of the month you're in or the previous two months. So June was 3.09%. And if you wait till October, because it's August, September, October, three months forward, you know you can use 3.35%. So get this thing going because the rates are going up. And you can do a three-year note, a nine-year note, a longer than nine-year note, of course, or for a 73-year-old, a 12-year balloon note, self-canceling installment note, would have to bear interest at 9.01% if you're going to use the August rate, but it will cancel on death if you die within the 12 years. If you want to go longer than the 12 years, you can, but then you have to hire Professor Jerry Hash to tell you what the interest rate markup will be, because to my knowledge, none of the commercial softwares are willing to do that. So again, just to illustrate this for those of you who are normal learners, not fire fast learners. We put 20 million in an LLC. We put a SLAT together, also could be known as a spousal beneficiary trust. Now the whole thing about there's this spousal limited unit trust where the spouse gets just a certain percentage of the trust each year. You probably don't want one of those. Um, they refer to it as the SLAT and you really don't want those big payments coming out. All right, so $700,000 seed capital payment and 49.5% of a $20 million LLC is a 6.9 note. Now on the other side, here is Marsha. So here's me and here's Marsha. She looks pretty good, doesn't she? So she sets up a trust. She doesn't like me so much. So she just trusts, sets up a trust for our daughter and our daughter's descendants and charities. And she does the same thing. Now, I'm not a beneficiary of this trust. However, if this trust is formed in an asset protection jurisdiction, I'm pretty comfortable if I could be added as a beneficiary of this trust if I ever had unforeseen circumstances such as a divorce, which I hope would never happen after 41 years of marriage, or we became destitute, which I also, by the way, hope never happens. So then you show the client 10 years later, the assets have doubled in value, and these, these trusts have $26 million in them. So that avoids estate tax on both sides. And then here I show that when we actually put these together, we want to have a separate, what's sometimes called a control trust or a Jordal trust. That's what John Grisbeck calls it. And that trust owns a tiny sliver of the LLC and has an independent, different trustee who has the right to control if and when there will ever be a liquidation or distribution 
of an asset from the LLC. So sorry that I have digressed, but I just wanted to give you all the charts. And now the magic of polling. Here is slide 48, and we'll dance around this poll. First of all, the advantages of a slap. Number one, not subject to estate tax if done right. Number two, creditor proof because I'm not a beneficiary, I'm the grantor. My spouse is limited to receiving what she needs for health, education, and maintenance, and as and as an independent trustee may give her. So it is creditor proof to my knowledge in all 50 states, including the state of confusion. And then also in territories, including Guam. C can benefit the grantor spouse and descendants. Well, which spouse is that? The first one, the second one, the third one? Well, maybe all three, depending on how you draft it, if you're gonna have a floating spouse provision. That may depend on how your spouse looks in the water. Or D, the proper answer for those of you who are in a hurry to get to the rest of this presentation, the, re the proper answer equal to what I would get if I took a course in computer literacy is D, all of the above. And the ro drum rolls. Thank you, orchestra. And the right answer is D. Okay, so once upon a time, Christy Nicolo, Brock Exline, and I wrote an article on the Florida SLAT. Now, Florida is not a creditor protection state. So instead, it had to write a poem about SLATs. And in addition, in on May 10th, an effective July 1st, a SLAT or any irrevocable trust in Florida can go a thousand years, not just 360 years. So that hopefully will make a big difference. I love the fact that I draft a lot of these trusts and make them as unchangeable as I can and that they will go 1,000 years. Do you know what a dollar that doubles every 10 years for a 1,000 years is worth? It will break your calculator, so don't even try it. In addition, the new Florida statute says that if I set up the slat and I can become a beneficiary of the slat after the death of my spouse, then I am not considered to be a contributor to the trust for Florida law purposes. And as a result of that, my creditors cannot reach into the slat, even though I am guaranteed the right to be a beneficiary after the death of my spouse. Now that's gonna cause a lot more people to be pulled off of respirators by their grantor spouses. But maybe just a handful, I don't know, there's not been a study performed on that. But you know, you're mad at your spouse and then suddenly there's this slat and things can happen. So if you're not sure about how your spouse really feels about you, you probably shouldn't let that spouse put together a Florida slat for you. But in any event, there will be a lot of mistakes made in uh, this area. So uh, I'm not gonna go into significant detail on the Florida slat, except to say that Florida is an exception creditor state, which means I could set up a trust, it's irrevocable, I'm not a beneficiary, but if I run up debt, to a lawyer representing me relating to that trust, and I can't afford to pay her, she can reach into the trust. If I run up alimony, my spouse can reach into the trust. If I run up child support, my child can reach into the trust. So is the trust subject to estate tax on the grounds that I can benefit from it by running up those kinds of debts? Those are called exception creditors. So we have a workaround for the exception creditor. And this was in the article that you, I believe, have uh, access to. And that is with Bloomberg BNA. 
and it's the ECT trust. Now that's kind of a joke because it really, et cetera, is ECT, but we had to make, I'm sorry, et cetera is ETC, but I wanted to make a word and most people don't even know this. So we called it the ECT trust. And what I would do now is let's say I set up a $10 million slat and now I'll set up a set in Florida. I set up a separate $500,000 slat, which says this slat will be spent less, last, but will be used first if there is ever an exception creditor. So then I run up two, $300,000 worth of alimony. That does not touch the slat. The slat is very, the, the big slat, it's very unlikely to be touched. But the big slat also has a very interesting provision, which says, by the way, I learned from Professor Hesch, whenever you use the word interesting, people say, oh, well, maybe it'll be interesting. Okay, it has an interesting provision, which says, the trustee is strongly requested to get any exception creditor paid from the smaller trust. And if and when an exception creditor would ever be able to reach anything from this trust, Allen will no longer be a beneficiary because he doesn't deserve it. So we think that that takes care of the exception creditor issue in Florida, so it's safer to have a Florida slat. But the one thing I wanna caution you about is Florida also has a provision that says that the trustee of a trust can repay the grantor of the trust for the taxes that the grantor pays. And that the, that repayment, if permitted in the trust, can pile up and become very large and a creditor can't reach it. But my question is, if there's an expectation that that repayment is going to be made, then you may have what's called a 2036A issue where you've given assets away and retained their use for your lifetime. So I think you wanna be careful if you're gonna have a reimbursement clause. So. That's a little bit on Florida slats. Now, our third and almost last polling question is, the answer here is not clear. Would you like to subscribe to our Thursday report? We issue it usually every two or three Thursdays, but sometimes only monthly. It usually has humor, that is not very funny, and also articles which are sometimes interesting. And the answer here is either A, yes, B, I already do, or C, I would rather have a spinal tap. So once we get the answer to this, after a sound effect, then we'll go to the next part of this exciting presentation. Thank you, Brittany. And Brittany, what were the answers? Do you know? Oh, 47% of you already get the Thursday report. Oh, you're such white liars. Thank you, though. Or did most of the other people want the spinal tap? 14% of you wanted the spinal tap. Okay. So there is the Florida Trust Code section that is involved here. And uh, we've got stuff that you can read relating to that. I'm gonna come back to the last polling question. And uh, I want let's just talk briefly about the Florida mistakes that will be made. First, you can only be added after your spouse dies, not under any other circumstances. So, if you go to uh, an asset protection jurisdiction like Nevada, Delaware, Alaska, or South Dakota, those are the four that we like, then you could be added in the event of a divorce or in the event your net worth ever goes down precipitously, having nothing to do with rain. But in Florida, only if the spouse dies. Um, number two, uh, the SLAT needs to provide that the spouse will be a beneficiary for her or his entire lifetime. 
It can't say what a lot of slats say, which is I'm putting my premarital assets into this slat for a very, very loved spouse who will be ousted from this trust in the event of a divorce so that my next spouse, that floating spouse, the one who looks good in the water, is going to be the replacement spouse. But what you could do in a Florida slat, and we've done this, is say that if we get divorced, my present spouse will have no vote in the slat and will only be a discretionary beneficiary. And I will encourage, but can't require the trustee not to make a distribution for her. And my new spouse and the one after that and the one after that and the one after that will also be beneficiaries of the slat. So you do have to think about when you're designing a slat, we have one primary form we use when it's a marital asset. We, Marsh and I have been together 41 years. I don't have any assets of my own. What I put in a slat is all ours. And if we get divorced, that slat would divide into two different trusts. One trust continues to be a slat for Marsha, controlled by Marsha, and the other trust is used to buy firearms, which will be used to shoot me, or will become a trust for our descendants that I will be able to choose and replace the trustee of. So that would be thinking about what to do, what kind of slat, because I'm sorry, the other slat is if my client, it's all pre not premarital assets, the spouse is going to be eliminated or at least disabled on uh, in the event of divorce. So then we talked about the discretion to reimburse uh, for taxes. And then uh, what about trust protectors who can change the rules? If the trust protectors who can change the rules, which we strongly encourage you to have in trusts, are not bound by a fiduciary uh, I mean, are bound by a fiduciary duty to remove the beneficiary trust, then that would invalidate the SLAT in Florida. So what you want to do there is say that the trust protectors cannot completely eliminate my dear spouse from being a beneficiary of this trust in the event of a divorce or in any other reason, but they could reduce the spouse's uh, interest as long as they don't reduce it by more than uh, an amount sufficient so that the spouse is still a beneficiary under this in, in uh, Florida statute. And then number five, you do have the relationship situation. Will he unplug me? Will he not unplug me? Does he love me? Does he love me not? Well, not so sure. And then uh, I do mention the Florida Community Property Trust, which is a really nice piece of legislation. And I've never met anyone who's done a community property trust in Florida yet. But if you have done one, please let me know and I will send you a free book. Okay, so we talked about 2036A. It is the kryptonite for many good, otherwise good estate plans. So let's make this the code section of the day. Ding, 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 ding. Okay. Okay. The code section of the day. For the IRS, this rings the registers. Okay. Anybody going to see Roger Waters in Orlando Thursday? I will be there. So if you want to see me and talk about section 2036A before the show at the Amway Arena in Orlando, seeing Roger Waters, who wrote Dark, who wrote much of the Dark Side of the Moon album, and I believe the entire Wall album. The handwritten lyrics are part of the album. They're really interesting lyrics. All right, back to 2036A. If the decedent, that's someone who became dead, made a transfer, except for a bona fide sale for adequate and full consideration, and the transfer was made, whereby he or she retained for her lifetime. See the sexist language here? Don't you wish this meant that no woman could be subject to a state tax under 2036A? Anyway, under which he has retained for his lifetime or for a period which does not in fact end before his death. And that probably is how this presentation seems, like it's never gonna be over. 
retained either one, the right to the income from the property. Okay, so I set up this slat, and this slat says that on my spouse's death, I become the beneficiary with the ability to receive amounts as needed for health, education, and maintenance, and I'll be the trustee. Bzz, don't do that, because now I would have the right to the income. Somebody else needs to be the trustee, someone independent of me. Or secondly, do I either alone or in conjunction with other people have the right to designate who will receive the assets from that trust? That's another reason that I don't want to become the trustee of a trust that I form unless my duties do not include the ability to designate how assets will pass. So as a result of that, we almost, almost, almost never appoint the grantor of a trust to be the beneficiary of that trust. But I think there was a case called Turnberry back in the 80s, which said you could, but you have to be very, very careful. So be careful out there with 2036A. There is the case of the person who gave the ranch away and said, oh, but just let me leave one cow there. Just one cow. Well, the IRS had a cow and they decided that this was the right to enjoyment of the property. So apparently not only was the cow there, but the cow was enjoying the property. You know, you see a laughing cow, there's just nothing quite like one. They're always partying and having a good time. So that is what happened there. Um, maybe the cow wore a moo moo, I don't know. Okay, so we have more information on uh, these situations. I want to mention uh, for those of you who are lawyers and CPAs that this exception creditor issue I was talking about, a lot of people think it's not a problem, but it has been reported that the IRS will not rule on whether an asset protection trust that's in a jurisdiction that allows exception creditors may be subject to section 2036A. There was a bankruptcy court case in Ray Mortensen where the IRS, I mean, where a creditor was able to pierce an asset protection trust. So after that, someone from Wilmington Trust Company, which is a great trust company, and involving Richard Nino, who is one of the most brilliant tax lawyers on the face of the earth and a wonderful author and person, went to the IRS and said, hey, can we do it again? And the IRS said, we can't tell you whether we, you can do it again. So that's why that little bit of concern over exception creditors and asset protection trusts in general is out there and should be um, attended to. So here I have the uh, the article article excerpts about those items. Now, hopefully, the exception creditors won't be a problem because of something called the Doctrine of Acts of Independent Significance. And I want to mention this briefly because we do have situations where trusts are drafted and we look at them and go, oops, you've retained control. Well, how have I contained control control? Well, you've signed a trust which says that your niece will inherit the condominium from the trust, but only if she attends your daughter's wedding. So if you don't invite her to your daughter's wedding, then she loses the condo. So you actually have control over whether she's going to inherit the condo. Or it says, this goes to my fiance unless we break up. Now, is that, is breaking up with your fiance a act of independent significance? I believe it would be, but the IRS may disagree. There is a ruling which says that a divorce or a legal separation, the ability to cause yourself to be divorced or to have a legal separation which causes your spouse to not inherit 
is an act of independent significance, but the ability just to break up with your fiance, maybe it, maybe it revolves around how much you really like the fiance or who knows. So that's the doctrine of independent significance. Maybe you don't think that that's significant, but some people think it does. Some people think it is. Okay. So now let's be practical and go back to the last polling question. These pesky little polling questions, where are they? I think I saw it. It's yellow. Um, does anyone remember when hamburgers came in yellow paper? Page 64. If you're thinking about a hamburger, please order one for me as well. Slat features can include A, divide in half with separated control on divorce. B, the grantor can become the beneficiary in an asset protection trust slat that is properly drafted based upon acts of independent fiduci uh, significance, which has nothing to do with an ax or giving someone the ax. C, your spouse can have a power to direct how the trust assets will pass on his or her death. Or D, all of the above. Now, that was not a real dog barking. If any of you are animal rights activists, I can assure you that I do not have a dog in this studio. Oops, sorry, I pushed the wrong button. That's for Halloween. All right, Brittany, how are we looking here? All right, very good. And the correct answer was D. Okay, let me decide what to talk about next in the world of slats. And that is a slat checklist. Number one, will you have a floating spouse or can he even swim? Number two, will the spouse have the ability to direct how the trust assets pass? And if so, will they need to get permission from anybody? C, will the floating spouse only benefit during the lifetime of the grantor? And after the grantor's death, it's only for the grantor's descendants. D, what happens on remarriage? Many of our trusts say that if, my, if I die and my, and my spouse remarries, the new spouse has to agree never to try to invade the trust or my spouse's control over that trust will be diminished. That means small. Okay, E, does it divide on divorce? F, if I want to toggle off grant or trust status, now that has nothing to do with building blocks or uh, other things. Toggle off means I set the trust up, my spouse is the trustee. As long as my spouse is the trustee, I am taxable on the income from that trust and I can exchange assets and sell assets with the trust and not pay any income tax. It's all considered as disregarded, like most of what I'm saying here today. So, if my spouse is not the trustee and no one has the power to replace trust assets with assets of equal value, and no one has the power to add beneficiaries, no one has the power to borrow for inadequate security or certain other things. And there's an adverse party, another beneficiary who would have to approve anything given to the spouse. Then, that was a long sentence, wasn't it? Then the trust could be taxed as a separate entity called a complex trust. And I don't have to be taxed on the trust. So as Professor Jerry Hesch often says, when you set up one of these slats, you have to watch out and think about the burn. And the burn is what happens when you pay the tax because of the trust. So remember in my example, you set up a 10 million trust, it's worth 20 million, it's worth 40 million, it's worth 60 million in, three, in 30 years. It's churning out a lot of income, I'm paying the tax, I could run out of assets. So if my spouse is removable as a beneficiary or 
some another beneficiary has to approve distributions for the spouse and none of those grant or trust spou powers, normally the power to replace trust assets with assets of equal value are in there, then the trust can be complex. There's another tax alternative that you want to keep open by drafting using trust protectors. And that is that you may want to make part of the trust into a Section 678 trust. And you're saying, what is Section 678? I guess you missed the whole TV series on Section 678 and the Smith family. So the Smith family, they were born in the wilderness and they lived on a wagon and they set up a slat and then little William, the youngest son, wanted to homestead a property. In fact, he wanted to do it in Florida because Florida was giving away 40 acre free homesteads, but he needed money to build the house on the homestead. So his parents went to the trust protectors of the slat and the trust protectors of the slat said, we'll move 50,000 of your 400,000 into a new trust for spouse and William and his siblings. And we will give William 30 days to withdraw what's in the trust. If he doesn't withdraw it, then it'll still be held for spouse and William. Spouse will not be the trustee, it will not be a grant or trust, and therefore William will be considered to be the owner of the trust. And therefore, when William sells the homestead at a gain, he will get the $250,000 exclusion from capital gains. So that $250,000 exclusion under Section 121 was there back in the 1800s, right when they invented the, the internet. And that's a perfect example. That TV show, remember the first season, they set up the slat, and then the second season, they removed the adverse, they put in an adverse party by the trust protectors. And remember the third season was when they set up that amazing section 678 trust. You can Google IRC section 678 and there it is, along with information on that Western. All right, page 114. Are you going to put the SLAD in an asset protection jurisdiction? I would say about 65% of our clients put the SLAD in the asset protection jurisdiction. About 35% of our clients put the SLAD in Florida or the other, or whatever their home state is. And uh, the, the advantage there is that the grantor can be added back as a beneficiary if and when there's been an act of independent significance. Now, I think a lot of law firms just say that the trust protector can add the grantor anytime the trust protector wants without there needing to be an act of independent significance. It's safer to have an act of independent significance, but you may sleep better if you don't need one. But in any event, you want to make sure that the trust protectors are not fiduciaries. So buy them a t-shirt that says, I am not a fiduciary. It's almost impossible to be a thousand percent sure that they're not gonna be fiduciaries if a judge says that they were, but you can put in the document, the magic language, no trust protector shall be considered a fiduciary or have any fiduciary duty to act, but at the same time, a trust protector cannot act for themselves. So a lot of clients want their children to be the trust protectors and their children are the beneficiaries of the trust. I'm not comfortable with that. Some clients say, well, can my son be a trust protector for my daughter? My, trust protect my daughter can be a trust protector for my son. Well, I'm not comfortable with that because I've met their son and their daughter. No, I wouldn't be comfortable with anybody's, uh, anyone having reciprocal trust protector uh, positions. All right. Number four, will you have a clause that says, if my child is a beneficiary and gets married, nothing from the slat until that spouse's lovely spouse or handsome spouse 
signs an agreement never to try to have that trust considered to be an asset for my child when determining alimony or and that trust will never will always be off limits and in fact that spouse upon divorce will pay the trustee of the trust any amounts over five thousand dollars that the trustee ever has to pay by reason of any such assertion by the spouse or by reason of discovery against the trust beyond having tax returns and financial statements. Okay, number five, will distributions after the death of the grantor be limited to a certain amount? Don't spoil your children. Remember the Robert Heinlein uh, saying that don't ruin your child's life by making it easy. So a lot of clients, when we, when we uh, suggest it, will say, yeah, I like that $150,000 a year clause. The child will never receive more than $150,000 a year inflation adjusted, plus what's needed for the education and direct education expenses and medical expenses of the, of the children of the child, because I want the child to work, unless consented to by Uncle Harry, who is never going to let them get away with anything until Uncle Harry gets dementia and lets them get away with everything. So maybe that should go to a trust company. Okay, six, do you want to allow charity to receive distributions? Do you want to require charity to receive distributions? Do you want to limit how much charity could receive? There could be tax planning reasons and flexibility reasons to mention charity in your slat. So um, let me see if I have any questions here from the audience. Okay, the first one is, could you cut out the humor? It's not funny and it's distracting. Okay, Jesse liked the, the, the bull shooting about the cow by the IRS logic. Okay, could the cow be on the ranch if a fair market rental price was paid? The answer is yes, but the cow needs separate independent legal representation before she signs the agreement. And the real answer is yes, as long as you pay fair rental value. Now, I'm working on an article today with Marty Shinkman on the whole question of what is fair market value rental? Because I, you say to the client, well, how often are you there? I'm there a month a year. All right, well, what does it rent for a month? Well, it rents for 6,000 a month. Okay, what does it rent for a year? Well, it rents for 18,000 a year. Okay, then you need to pay 8,000 18, rent. And the client says, no, I'm only there a month. Okay, who's there the rest of the year? No one. Okay, what would, what would you charge someone to have exclusive use of it for the whole year? 18,000. Okay, so that's the fair rental value. Now that is in addition to the value of the cow. Okay, you heard about it, it was so hot that the um, that the corn turned into popcorn, and the cows saw that and thought it was snow, and they froze to death. So just make sure your cows know that popcorn is not snow. Okay. And Elizabeth says that this is hilarious and fun. I suggest that you discuss this with your mental health counselor. Um, confused between the client spousal beneficiary and the client spouse. Okay, the client spousal beneficiary and the client spouse are usually the same person when he's on his medication. When he's not on his medication, you can't be absolutely sure, but the intent would be that he would be the same spouse. Karen says there was no polling question. I'll give you a polling question. What is Matt Polling's phone number? So Matt Polling's phone number is 813-223-7474. Um, so that would be your fourth polling question. And I hope you got it right. Okay, where is the handcuff section? Lillian, um, this is not an adult program. So there is no handcuff section um, in this program, but there's other things on YouTube that you could probably see if you search handcuffs. 
tax planning, then maybe you could meet another tax professional to help you with that one. Okay. Camlish says, I directly registered for this webinar. Will I get CE credit? Um, if CE stands for Connecticut, the answer is yes, if you came in through CPA Academy. As to the other 49 states, the answer is yes. Okay. Um, Sinetra says, hello from Tulsa. You have our sympathy. Then, um, oh, Alan says, Matt, Matt's phone number is actually his direct line is apparently 813-867-5309. Okay. And then Alan says, keep the information coming because the humor is not so good. All right. David has a question. He is wondering how to ask the monarch of a kingdom who has four children, the oldest being 32. Company made 30 million last year. The 29 was not interested in the business and the father funded a car auto repair station. Um, my advice is to marry into that family just as quickly as you can. And the problem is though, you would have to know international tax law in order to represent that particular family. But send them over and I will try my very best. All right, so that answers all of the questions that I really know the answer to. Thank you for those. And then, oh, maybe you could play a joke on CPA Academy and maybe put in your review that the uh, presenter kept cussing. Um, there was a cow on the show and you couldn't understand how the cow had anything to do with CPA Academy. Let's just kind of freak them out a little bit because they don't really, they're not watching these, they're just watching the reviews. So. Um, really enjoyed when he poured water on his head or something like that. Okay, let's see if we have one last thing. Then Don's going to come across and make me look like less of a dummy. All right, can the settler's spouse split the gift? Can I put $10 million in that trust and we consider it to be $5 million from me and $5 million from Marsha because of the split gift return, which has nothing to do with my split ends on my hair. And the answer is, is she reasonably expected to benefit from the trust? So if the trust says that she must first benefit from all her own assets first, and she has a lot of assets, then you could split the gift. But just be aware the IRS may contest the um split gift so that takes care of what i intended to say today and here is don brian the amazing don brian uh fresh from parole we were able to get him released <laughs> and hello alan off my screen are you hearing me no i can't hear you okay i, heard, I can't I can't hear that? that you just spoke. I can't that hear is, that you said how about that. Uh, you you got how about that? I can't hear that you said how about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's stop that now. You're going back to your cow jokes, right? <laughs> Sorry about I, that. It was a bunch was, of dung. I was just listening to your presentation and uh, and the commentary, and you know it's funny how people respond to humor. Uh, because it's very uh, subjective. People, one person thinks it's funny, another person thinks it's not funny, and they just don't get it, or they're not willing to lighten up a little bit and allow a little discourse, perhaps. But at the same time, appreciate the fact that, hey, this is making it far more interesting. Are you getting me okay? Yeah, well, I hear you fine. Let's bring on Noseworthy and start talking about estate planning. Oh, we can do that. Yeah, hold on. He's right here. <clears throat> um, uh, Noseworthy. It's uh, showtime. Huh? Showtime. Uh, all right. Is it, is, it, is it Alan again? Yeah, it's, it's Alan. Uh, hello, Alan. Hello, Alan. Hey, Noseworthy. How are you doing? I'm not that good. No, no. No, he, he's doing just fine. Speak for yourself. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, we, we're here to learn something today. Yeah, 
Yeah, they are. Yeah. And the important thing is that you listen. Yes. And don't, you know, don't be critical. No. Try and understand. Yeah. That Mr. Gassman is, is a ventriloquist. That's right. Yes. What's he doing doing this? Well, this is what he does. But he, he talks about estate planning. Oh, right. Is that what we're going to do? Well, yeah, I thought we could. Alan could help us with that. Yeah. He's got questions for us. Yeah. And things that I think will be interesting to uh, other than Chiloquist, perhaps, and Donnie's. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. you, do you like Donnie's, sir? Yes, he does. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. yeah. I do, except when they're in dummy governments. Yeah, uh, oh, good. That's a puppet government, sir. Puppet government. <laughs> yeah. Right. Okay. Have you been in well, government? Let's see if we can uh, find something out today. We need to learn. Yes, yes. Do you have any questions for us, Alan? Yeah, the first the first question I have is, do you want to be a body parts donor? Is that for you? Uh, well, either of us. Yeah. Well, I got parts that are replaceable, and he he doesn't. No, no, I don't. Yeah, I, I would suppose. Yeah, uh, you could donate your brain, my brain. Yeah, you're not. It's hardly used. Oh, thank you. Yes, that's <laughs> important. You know. Yes, uh, I would consider that. Yes, I would. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I can make any money. No, no, it's a donation. Yeah. When I pass away, yeah, mm -hmm. then body parts are donated. Uh -huh. So what do they do at night dates? Well, uh, you, well, you're not going to pass away. Oh, yeah, you're going to live in perpetuity. A long time. Oh, mm. I guess I'm going to live a long time. Mm. So long as I got insurance for fire and theft. That's right, fire and theft. Yes, yes. I, I don't know. Uh, body parts, yeah, of course. Yeah, I would consider that. Yeah, only the good bits. That's right. Some of them ain't working. I, yeah, okay. We're going to go into that. Yeah. You got parts that don't work. I know. Yeah. Yeah, things that don't work. Okay. Yeah, they're just like dead. All right. Yeah, he's prostate the size of the daigle. Look, yeah, his kidneys are they're rolling stones. Uh, uh, yeah, what are you doing? This is my organ recital for you. I see. Yeah. <laughs> organ wow. recital. So there, I, mean, I don't you, know. I mean, Don, Don, between you and me, would you ever sell Noseworthy? Sell? <laughs> yeah, I'm not for sale. No, 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 no. You're going to get probably get donated to the museum. Oh, which one? Well, there are a few. There's the Ventriloquist Museum in uh, Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. I think you know about that. Yeah. And that's where all the all the dummies are donated. Well, you should go. Thank you. Yes, yeah. That is probably where uh, Noseworthy will end up. Yeah, it depends, though, you know, on the family. Yeah. Nobody in the family is interested in carrying on what I do. Talking to yourself, playing with dolls. That's right. Yes. <laughs> That's something only weirdos can do. Alan, you're on the right track. Okay. <laughs> uh, the important thing to do. Uh, to remember is that I'm sorry, my phone is annoying. I should have taken care of that. Yes, you should. But the important thing to remember, of course, that you know we want to preserve a little legacy of what's you know what I have done. Not much over the, the years. Yes, uh, I've written a book. Yeah, and uh, you know, and done shows. Yes, yeah. But you will be donated to the museum. Uh huh. And there's nobody in my family that's interested in carrying on this uh craft or yeah, that's what you call it yes yeah, right yeah i don't know if that answers your question it does beautifully so here's my next question does noseworthy have disability insurance oh that's a good one yeah do i do you have disability insurance said yeah well i you know well yes he does i do yes yes oh i know i know what he means yes you see sometimes uh uh, I get lost in luggage. Mm -mm. Oh yeah, when we're flying, they lose my luggage. Mm -hmm. So I could claim disability, <laughs> lost luggage disability. Yeah, something like that. Do yeah. You, that, do you get claustrophobia? Do you get claustrophobia? Or are there any? Oh, oh yeah, yeah, occasionally, occasionally. I'm trying to get an extension on my case. Oh, you are. Yes, I want a pool room. A pool room. <laughs> yeah. We'll work on that. Yeah, the claustrophobic, uh, I don't think so. Well, I get out now and then. What are you doing? I'm making you more comfortable. I didn't ask you. What's this doing? What the hell are you doing? Okay, don't touch me there. Sorry. <laughs> They're having an argument. He's arguing with himself. Yeah. This is what happens when cousins marry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry about 
about that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I don't know. Uh, that that's where it is right now. Yeah, we're 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 just going to look at the future when it comes. Yeah, I, yeah, I think that's pretty good. When the future arrives, yeah, you're going to deal with it. Yeah, that's right. Oh, I see. Okay, this is not good planning, Alan. Mm -hmm. uh, are you looking for a new partner, Alan? Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't yeah, I, yeah, well, when he croaks, yeah, thank you. <laughs> so I don't know if that answered your question, sir. But, uh, so no, Noseworthy, what, what, are, what is your financial retirement plan like? Oh, that's a good one, yeah. What is my financial retirement? Well, uh, it's not yours, for sure. Uh, no, no, no. I don't really know what I'm going to do when I retire. Well, when do you expect to retire? When you kick off. Oh, I see. <laughs> when I'm gone, yeah, you're retired. I guess that's it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so what are your plans? I don't know. Just sit around, right, in a suitcase, looking for a job. <laughs> Knows whether he doesn't have a retirement plan. No, neither do you. Well, we don't have to go there. You should. This is when you should. I, you don't have to retire then. Well, I, yeah, are you retired? Well, yes, I guess I could say. It. He's been retired for the last 50 years. Okay. <laughs> yeah, kind of, kind of. Well, yes and no. Uh, I don't have a retirement plan because I never planned on retiring. No, no. Uh, until, yes, until, until well, we had a, what I call a pandemic. Oh, yeah, that's, that, what's that? Uh, you don't know what it is. Uh, pandemic when you can't buy booze. Uh, fine. Yeah. Uh, that's when things changed for me. Yes. Our work really dropped off. It sure did. Mm -hmm. It just went off the end. It did. And uh, for the last two years and a bit, uh, hardly any work. No, not much. Just sitting around. Yeah, building puppets. But, you know, the thing is, uh, I never thought of things like that occurring. Who does? Who plans for something like that? So I was kind of forced into a sort of retirement. Yeah. And uh, I had never considered, never contemplated this this possibility of actually not being able to work. No. Mm -hmm. And now you're too goddamn old to work. Watch your mouth. Can't. Nose cuts off is you. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, the thing is, uh, I never, I never thought about retirement. I guess that's not a very smart way to go, but uh, you know, I figured I could always work. Yeah. So long as I could keep performing. Yeah. And this guy's still around. Yeah, yeah, sure. And he's all about me. <clears throat> well, so I never planned retirement in terms of uh, investment or uh, what my alternatives would be if I choose or could not or was unable to work. Yeah. I never thought about it, to be honest with you. And uh, I guess now I'm sitting here going like, well, I'm still able to do this, which I love. Thank you. And uh, I keep you going. Yes. Uh, I need you. Without me, you'd be doing seances. Yes. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I, I don't know if you call this the typical artist mentality, but uh money was never really yeah it isn't well it was never a, a a big motivation for me to amass a lot of money no it was more about i want to maintain my lifestyle yeah which is well you like uh coffee yeah, okay. wine wine yeah chocolate that's right and he smokes a pipe yes i do but the thing was to be able to be comfortable and and healthy yeah mm -hmm. healthy that's right and so that I could continue doing what I love to do, which is thank you. Yes, is working with my partner, Noseworthy. Don't be so condescending. I'm trying to be nice. Yes. So do I you, guess that is do you the pay, Yeah. Do you pay Noseworthy anything? Does Noseworthy get an allowance? Is there anything that Noseworthy would leave in trust if he died? There's an idea. Yeah. <laughs> do I pay Noseworthy? Go on. Answer that one. <clears throat> well, you don't, do you? No, you don't pay me. Well, yeah, you. I get a suitcase, right? Yeah, I get to do a show now and then, right? And that's it. No money, nothing. It's just goodwill. Can't live on goodwill. <laughs> no, we uh, we have a um, what do we call it? Yeah, it's a a symbiotic relationship. Yeah, I never touched you. Yep, yeah, fine. You know what? I'm saying. Yeah. <laughs> now, have you have you guys talked about a will about what you would put in your will besides? Huh? 
a mm -hmm. will. Mm -hmm. You mean like when you're gone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What happens? Well, yes, I, I have considered a will. Yes, in fact, he's he's done it. Yes, I, I renewed it recently, and so you should. Yeah, and uh, yes, I, I I made out a will. Yeah, and what are the kids going to get? Well, your debt. You <laughs> hopefully not. Um, I, I'm a collector of things. Yes, anything but money. Yes, I collect things. I have ventriloquist characters. Yes, I, I, I have art. I'm a collector of uh, art. I enjoy beautiful things. Yes, yes, too bad she's not here. Yeah, well, <laughs> you won't go there. You wish you could. All right, yeah, his sex life ain't so good. Quiet. Yeah, he's, uh, never mind. Don't get personal. Okay, fine. All right, let's not talk about that. Okay, no sex life, none. You're still holding your own. I beg your pardon? No, then I, all right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, that's where we're at right now. I don't know uh, if I've answered your question properly. Yes. But retirement was never an option for me. And yeah. And uh, there's no, yeah, there's no reason for it to. You're you're vibrant and going and going. That's so, right. Keep going. Keep so going. Have you, of, yeah, have, you, have you thought about who would make your medical decisions if you were ever incapacitated in those weeks? Oh, that's good. What if I can't work? <laughs> He's talking about me. Oh, hmm. if you have medical conditions, yeah, it's probably can be fixed with strings, glue, and screws. That's right. Yes, yes. <laughs> me, on the other hand, I've been very lucky. Uh, I haven't had any really any serious medical issues. I have a little arthritis. You got it. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, a little arthritic. Nothing I can't handle. Yeah. Uh, if I get to the point where I cannot work, what now? Well, then, then you're done. Well, I am taking a bit of a risk, I believe, but I've that I'm 80 years old. You're 81. I'm barely touching 81. Touching, you're beating it to death. Okay, fine. <laughs> That's where we're at. Yeah. I don't want to see myself not working. No. I want to be able to work. If I couldn't work, uh, then uh, I would have a problem. I definitely would. Yeah, I just have to scale down. Yeah, I'll move into a suitcase. Yeah. <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. So what about any any sort of charitable dispositions that we should put in your wills and trusts besides leaving those worthy to the museum? I I I think you should do that. Yeah. Yes, I do. I I'm. Uh, I have a, a daughter who's diabetic, and I have contributed to that. Yes. Uh, I had a, a brush with uh, don't talk about brushes. Well, it was it was an issue of uh, cancer potential. Yes. Hmm. Uh, you want to talk about it? No, not really. No. Okay. Is that it? No, that's it. Yeah. Okay. It's, you know, your prostate thing. I know. Yeah. Other than that, it's really big. Look, I don't want to talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Now you got me right off the topic. Good. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know, Alan. The, things are okay for me <clears throat> don't worry mm -hmm. the thing is you know what the thing you've been doing all your life yes the way you've always thought mm -hmm. you keep on thinking the way you always thought you're always going to get what you always got what's that nothing i think thank you very much little philosophy from noseworthy yeah <laughs> so nose noseworthy if if you Let's say that your suitcase is lost and we can never find you. How do you feel about Don having another primary puppet? There's a good Could there be an agreement that he can't do that. Well, uh, it's happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it has happened. Yeah, a couple of times. That's right. Yes. Well, I fly a lot because that's what my job requires me to do. Yeah, travel, travel. Yeah, flying to a ship. Yes. Yeah. And the suitcases get lost occasionally, or at least mislaid for a short time. Yeah, we delay the show. We do that. I have turned up at uh, engagements, gigs, yeah. without my my act. Yes, mm -hmm. but I have I have the heads. Thank you. Yes, uh, your head is still on. Yeah, I carry the heads in a separate carry-on bag. That's the story of my life, a carry-on bag. Yes. So i uh, I was in Las Vegas. Uh, had to do a, a show for a group of people for fairs and exhibitions showcase. Yeah. Baggage didn't turn up. No. 
So I had the heads, thank you. So I did a bit with just the heads, yes. And I sang a song, it was kind of corny. Yeah, I think it was, I ain't got no body. That was a song, yes. <laughs> well, that, that can be, yeah, that's kind of weak. Yes, it is, yeah. So you do it just with it. So he lost his head and, and you just did it while he was still ahead. Lost the bodies. Yes. He yeah, lost the body. Out of, out, of, out of body experience. You know what I'm saying, Alan? Mm -hmm. The thing is, you see, uh, I was able to do something and yeah, perform with the heads. Yes. And uh, and that was it. Yeah. But, but you know what? I, I had a lot of fun with it, actually. I improvised yes, and uh, managed to get around the problem. And in fact, uh, worked with some of the guests uh, in the audience and uh, made them into my puppet, if you wish. Yes. Uh, it's a little bit in the show that I do with a, a, a volunteer where I make him talk and sing and do silly stuff. Yeah. So I did that. Yes. Yeah. And that 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 was good. So anyway, it worked. I, I've never completely been without the dolls. Dolls. My character, yeah, my friends, <laughs> uh, for any length, extended length of time. I've always, and I also, I've got a duplicate of this guy. You do? Mm-hmm. What? Yeah. You got a what? Yeah, your original first you. Oh, and a clone. That's right. Yeah, Alan, we can do a clone for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, we, uh, we couldn't make a dummy out of Alan. No, couldn't find a piece of wood thick enough. <laughs> <laughs> Eating Alan. Yeah. Be nice. Right. He's a friend. He was. <laughs> oh, I've got some questions. I got some questions from the audience. Okay. Uh, first of all, they say that the cow jokes are utterly unacceptable. Oh, that's uh, good. <laughs> then they said there's a family resist resemblance, but Noseworthy has more hair on his head. That's from Jesse. Uh, uh, Julius wants to know if you if you work in the Catskills. Have you worked in the Catskills? No, really, Julius, the Catskills folded uh, that that circuit, if you wish, <laughs> ended many you know over thirty years ago. Yeah. Although many of the uh, famous comics back of the 60s, 70s, 80s uh, were Catskill, what we call Catskill Comics. They honed their craft in the Catskills at these uh, big resort hotels. Yeah. I never got to do that. No, that was something I aspired to do, but I was younger yeah. and didn't have the experience or the material. You still don't. Thank you. No, I have not done the cat skills. No, no. The other thought about the cow skills. Don't be stupid. That's Alan's joke. <laughs> so so uh, Jesse asked, what happened? Noseworthy, can you answer this? What happens if your head is in the bathtub? It, it what? If my head is, your head is in the bathtub. It's a it's a brain drain. Okay. <laughs> Randy. Randy, so Randy. Uh, when are you guys going to Vent Haven? Randy wants to know when you're going to, to Vent Haven. Do you want to explain what Vent Haven is? Vent Haven. Oh, yeah. We know where Vent Haven is. I, I visited Vent Haven uh, m my first time was 1976. All right. Yeah. Um, because I'd always known about Vent Haven. It's a, and Vent Haven, by the way, for those that people don't know, is a museum originally a private collection of ventriloquial paraphernalia. Uh, you need dummies, dummies, yeah, puppets, hundreds of them from all over the world. And the collection has grown steadily over the years, and so has the interest and the membership of the Ventriloquist Association. And they meet every July, usually, in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky, yeah, or Cincinnati, depending on what hotel they're using. But the museum is in Fort Mitchell. It was originally a, a two-car garage converted to a museum. It has now been converted from four garages into one magnificent museum building. Yes, I have yet to see the new the new facility, but I'm uh, looking forward to that. It's world famous, uh, believe me. It it has it, it's the uh, the mecca for ventriloquists around the world. There's no other place like it, and it is fun. They run their convention for uh, usually a week they have wow uh, oh yeah and usually there's anywhere from four to six hundred attendees yeah that means guests right yeah and they have uh, professional artists uh, people like myself jay uh, jay allen um, uh, um, 
gosh, name any one of the famous ventriloquists, the ones that are living, yeah. Usually there, they contribute their time, they do a show, we, we give lectures, uh, as I have done. I usually represent the Canadian contingent, mm. uh, <clears throat> with Noseworthy and some of my other characters. And I give lectures or talks on uh, actually working on cruise ships, which is, I have done a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> they have workshopping uh, where, you know, everything from how to write material to work on ships to build dummies. Yeah, they have a, a sales seminar, people selling puppets uh, of every kind of description and other ventriloquial paraphernalia. Yeah. Yes, it's worth going to. And even just yeah. as a curiosity, even if you're not into ventriloquism per se, it's a fascinating, fascinating place to go to and spend a day or two and check out the ventriloquists uh, museum and uh, the uh, the whole event is fun it's great i didn't we, go we, we have time. more we have more dummies at our tax events than you have at your ventriloquism events this is true yeah is there a museum for them <laughs> <laughs> tax dummies <laughs> there should be okay i got another question here yeah uh, noteworthy i mean noseworthy yeah. What's it like to watch Don teach? Because Don's teaching me, he's teaching a friend of mine. What's what's it like? Does it does it get old to watch him teach all the time? It's discouraging. <laughs> Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, no, they're enjoying it. No, they're not. They're still doing what they always did. What's that working? Yeah. You don't want to do a ventriloquist, not work? That's what you want to do. Yeah. <laughs> No, I, I these gentlemen, Alan and his friend Alan, uh, I've been teaching yes. online. <clears throat> excuse me, uh, the art of ventriloquism. Yeah, and it's like anything else. You have to. It's like learning to play an instrument. Yes, I'm an instrument. We could call you an instrument. Yes, a woodwind. A woodwind. Okay. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, it's you have to spend the time practicing learning uh, the uh, the basics. Yeah, the fundamentals. I. Have these uh, have Alan and, and his friend Alan go through basic stuff like learning how to talk without moving your mouth. I can do it. Yes, it's easy. Yeah, it's not easy. Oh. Yeah, I could. Let me show you how it's done. Hi, how are you? Which one's the dunny? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got it. Yeah, but that uh, it's you know it's it's a process. I started when I was 13 years old. Huh? Yeah, a long time ago. And I didn't really know what I was doing. I had no one to instruct me. Now I had a book on ventriloquism and that's how I began. And not until I actually met Edgar Bergen personally. Huh? Yeah. Did he give me uh, some instruction because he was watching me perform. I did a little demo for him and uh, he gave me some guidance, which uh, was invaluable. And I have tried to stick to his idea of performing as a ventriloquist and artist and i still enjoy watching his shows i'm getting off the track here a bit but yeah it's something which is a passion for me and i know alan you you're having a lot of fun with it right now yes you are mm -hmm. your dummy is a lot smarter than you yeah yeah now that was not nice he knows what i mean yeah because the dummy is the same guy that's right one dummy to another that right <laughs> Alan, Alan's got a wonderful sense of humor. Yeah, and he is having some fun with it. Yeah, taking his character and injecting some humor at the same time. Yeah, and one of the things you can do is you've learned. Yeah, when yeah, I know how you're gonna say. I I know I know what he's gonna say, Alan. Right, I always know what he's gonna say. All right, <laughs> you can say things with your character that might be difficult for us to do ourselves it was not acceptable but you know through a character you can uh you, you have license to you know use the artist's creativity to um, expand on your thoughts your ideas or even the silliness of it and just uh, don't worry too much about you can't appeal to everybody's sense of humor yeah and uh it it makes things easier for you and for those listening because your topic is um let's say it's boring no it's it's dry it's dry yes and uh, look at all the books he's got behind and in the on in that room and he, he, he that's a showcase that's the, well he i think he hasn't read them has you yes he <laughs> yes he would have he's got a degree i got varying degrees yes Alan, I don't know if that answered your question, but um, 
that that's that's how I see it. Does Noseworthy want to be resuscitated? If if he ever had a heart, if he ever if his heart stopped, would he want to be resuscitated? That's one of the questions. Alan, take a close look at me. See, would. <laughs> Do you want to be resuscitated? Yeah, what does that mean? That means if your heart stops. Oh, right. Yeah, then what then? Well, then, yeah, no, no, it's not like that. Well, it is. And, and my heart stops. Yeah, no, it's you. You see, it's all about you. Right. Your heart stops and the line stops too. That's right. Do you want to be resuscitated? Yeah, because if you wake him up, I go with it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I suppose so. Yeah. Why not? And now, what if you got a disability once you're resuscitated, you're resuscitated, whatever the hell that is, resusc a disability, yes. What if you get a stroke and you can't talk or walk? Right. Well, it might improve your act. Uh, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So kind. Yes. yes, of course I would. But, you know, having uh, if something like tragic like that happened, I'm not sure. Uh, how I would cope with it. I'd have to be, uh, if you would, I'd have to maintain my sense of humor for sure. Uh, I've been so used to being active, uh, uh, creative. I, uh, you know, I love my life. I love what I do. I like to be busy. I'm not the type who can sit around for hours. I have to be doing something. I cannot, you like to do something. That's right. Not on your own. No. Yes, I'm fine on my own. Yeah. But that's a, that's a tough question, Alan. Yeah. Uh, I wouldn't be in a position when that day comes to be able to say, yeah, resuscitate me. No, because you probably couldn't say it. No, I probably couldn't say it. I'll <laughs> let you know it. Yeah. Yes, I suppose the answer to that is, of course, yes. Yes, unless you're brain dead, right? Then there's no difference. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> no help there. Don, Any do these, do, huh? these things that Noseworthy saying, how how much of it just is off the top of your head and how much of it are you drawing from prior material? Like Don's hair, it's off the top of his head. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> some of some of what you're hearing is uh, in, in material. Yeah, stuff he stole. No, no. There's a lot of material. There's material in what we have been doing today. I've used a few lines. Yes, yes. And uh, why not? For effect, for fun, for a laugh. Yeah, you want to get a laugh. Yeah, because otherwise it's drama. It's drama. Yeah, we don't want drama. No. So <laughs> uh, I, I I have to keep the humor in it. I have to be, I have to have fun with it. Otherwise, I, I become very boring. Become? Yes. <laughs> well, sir, somebody says noteworthy is certainly not a stiff. So... It's this not, has been a this has been a really nice conversation. Nose Noseworthy is not a stiff. No, oh, that was good. Yeah, yeah. Can you get her phone number? Yeah. 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 Oh, no, don't don't get there. No, yeah, yeah. Don't don't do. Okay, all right. I, you I can get see her on Facebook. Sorry. Hmm? You can see her on Facebook. Oh, good. Facebook. That's the answer. Yes, it is. <laughs> Ellen. Uh, yeah. Are oh, you going to make a speech? A little speech. I want to thank Alan for uh, having the confidence and faith in bringing me on into into your 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 program. I really feel flattered and enjoy talking to you. Yes. And I hope I've been able to contribute something. Oh, stop. Well, you know, done nothing. All right. You're just standing talking to yourself with a dummy. Right. Yeah. Sorry about the comment about dummy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And uh, Alan, I wish you the best of luck. Yeah. And uh, I hope we get to do this again. I'm open to questions. People want to know more about it, about ventriloquism. Uh, I can't talk much about retirement. Yeah, because you're not going to do it. No, <laughs> I, I guess not. Um, I, I, my philosophy is, you know, is to keep enjoying life and doing what you do best. Yes, is lying. I don't lie. Yeah. And have uh, have empathy for the rest of the people in your life who don't have dummies. <laughs> Perhaps, Alan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Don. Happy 81st birthday coming right up. And then, uh, if anyone wants uh, to get a copy of Don's book or to have Marsh and I had just a when I introduced Don 
and those worthy to Marsha. It was just a great day. So pay, pay Don a couple bucks, have him show up at your birthday video. Just delightful. The book is excellent. And the the, the uh, tutoring lessons are very good. So thank you well, so much for all of that. We got thank you for everybody. You. Thank you for everybody who stayed awake during the first hour so that you could attend the last half hour, <laughs> which I thought was great. Thank you all. Yeah. Bye, Ellen. All See right. Take care. Bye, folks. Bye. <laughs> and goodbye, everybody. Have a great, great rest of your weekend.